Welcome to the Cyber Security Workshop 2023. So we conduct this workshop every year, uh, mostly focused on freshers. So how many of you are in first year? Okay, so most of you are in first year. Okay, so uh, we'll cover this workshop from the basics. So you'll, you don't have to worry. <coughs> if you don't understand anything, you can interrupt. Okay, I'm just introducing this. Okay. So we go by the name White Bandits. So that is our team name uh, when we play any CTF. Uh, and we are also the cybersecurity division of the programming club. Okay. So uh, what is cybersecurity? Like apart from that, can anyone say? Anyone want to? Add on. Add on. Like, what does security mean? Protection? Yeah. yeah, protection. So, the cyber security means protection in the digital world, basically. Uh, so, in cyber security, basically, you have to, it, the thing you need to protect is basically information or data. Okay. So, there are various methods to protect it and there are various methods to compromise that data as well. So here, <coughs> like cyber security can be both ways, obviously. So basically this game of protection and exploitation uh, together comprises the field of cyber security. So you play it both ways, okay. So uh, security, so basically, Vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities arise due to poor implementation in applications. So if you don't, uh, it is basically a developer's mistake, if you say, or it could be design mistake, any mistake, but anything that leads to an unwanted access is a vulnerability, and that could be exploited and that should be patched. So how do vulnerability arise? Mistakes, obviously. So if you want to start up by start up into the field of cybersecurity, uh, first you should understand the, you should build your base uh, so that you understand the concepts very clearly so that you know what is happening. And a good way to start learning is by playing CTFs. So what are CTFs? So CTFs are capture the flag. So here I can show you an example. How does a CTF look like? So recently we recently we held a CTF, PV CTF. So I'm showing you that. So basically there are challenges here. Okay. So these are the challenges you can access. Okay. Now each challenge have some description. So there are different categories of challenges. So for example, say web. Okay. So here you are given a website and it is vulnerable in some way. Now, in exploiting, by exploiting that vulnerability, there is a flag hidden behind it. So you, you need to extract that flag, and then you have to submit your flag over here. Okay, and as if the flag you s submit is correct, then you get points, and that's how you play a CTF. So basically, CTFs are generally built on well-known vulnerabilities, or maybe new discovered vulnerabilities. So that way while solving the challenge, you learn new concepts. Okay. So the best way is to uh, start playing CTS if you want. Uh, and if you don't understand, then you can read the write-ups, which are basically solutions posted by other users. Okay. Then uh, the learning point like the inflection curve like uh, the learning curve of this uh, cyber security is very much steeper than other domains so uh, people generally need more patience in this field rather than like if you want to get started with cp suppose you can do it from day one but in cyber security you need to have some patience okay so you may not see the results in one or two days, okay. 
the best resource for cyber security is obviously Google. Mm -hmm. So your Googling skills matter a lot. So how you Google things uh, definitely places you in a uh, upper position than like if you keep just asking like instead of asking doubts you should first search it yourself and then uh, you you must do your thorough research and then come up with a genuine question to others but we are always here so you can ask us if you have any doubts regarding any of these okay uh, so I've told you the CTF uh, okay so now we will start with the web application security so generally we have four of these categories web applications cryptography uh, then binary exploitation uh, in which you reverse engineer a binary program uh, so first two will be covered in today's workshop and other two will be for tomorrow okay uh, uh, the fourth one is forensics okay so now so hello everyone i'm going to cover web application security so as you know, most of the applications you used are in the web and there are various vulnerabilities in it. We're going to learn the basics of the web and the end goal is to understand some vulnerabilities in it and how you can overcome them. So what is it? So web application security is the process of protecting the different websites and services from different security threats. So every new web framework that comes out, uh, you may have heard of them, React and so on. All of them have different vulnerabilities and you have to find them first and then you have to figure out a patch for them. Like basically how those vulnerabilities cannot be exploited anymore or how to remove them. Some common types of vulnerabilities are XSS, SQL injection, deserialization attack and others. So like as uh, Bhai already mentioned, there is a steep learning uh, slope for these because you have to have a good understanding of how the web applications work and about JavaScript also because most of the frameworks are built in these. So what, how, what, how the web works, like what is the architecture of it? So first as a user, you will, you will send some data and you can collect some data from the front end of any website. And then that front end will send some request and then it will get, get some response back from the server. So server is where the main business logic of the application is there and you always interact with the front end. In front end, the, generally the languages used are HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And for the web server, you can use various languages, PHP, JavaScript, Python, Java and so on. And then inside the web server, in order to host all the files and everything, you, you can either use the file system or you can use the database. So first we come to the front end. In the front end, we have HTML, JavaScript and CSS. So the HTML defines the structure of the page, like what are the different blocks of the page, it describes that. Then CSS describes all the styling of it, like what are the colors, fonts and everything. And JavaScript describes all the functionality of it, like if you click a button, what happens, that is determined by the JavaScript. HTML and CSS are not programming languages, this is important. So this is some HTML code. So this just describes the structure, I'll show some to make you understand better in a moment. This is the CSS code and this is the JavaScript code. So I'll show you a website so you can understand better. This is the code for the HTML code. So you can understand like this is the head, the upper portion of the page, which showed from my website thing. And then there is a style sheet style.css. So there is a CSS code which will define all the styling of the site. The, all the like text elements and all you saw, those are in the HTML code. And then there is a button. And what that button does is to be determined by the JavaScript code, script.js. So this will be the script.js. It's a very simple thing. When you click the button, it will give you an alert. And then the style.css. And this will determine all the like style of it. Like I can change the color or something here. And then if I like uh, reload the website, you'll get a different coloring of the button. Like I'll show that again. You can see.
see that the color of the this thing is uh, button is changed now. So, so any, doubt any doubts regarding HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? Anybody? Okay, good. So what are the ingredients for the web? Like what are the things you need uh, to like make this thing work? Like the request that goes to the front end and everything, how does that work? So first you have the clients, which are the web browsers. They send any sort of request, get, post, and there are other requests which will come to later. They send those requests to a URL, and then those, through those URL they are routed to some web server. And there the HTML document is there, that is sent back to your browser, and you can see it. So. Uh, as I said, this uh, you send a request, some data gets back. So all of this happens by following these TCP IP protocols. Protocols is simply a set of rules. So it is a family of communication protocols used to connect computer systems in a network. So the IP is a network layer protocol. It provides you, it tells the, how the data goes from like one end to other. The, the connection is established through TCP. And so that is the transport layer protocol. It establishes a good connection channel. And then IP tells how to move those data packets. Now IP doesn't give any proper ordering to the data packets. So TCP will determine how the data packets are properly reordered. And uh, then you can see them. So there are some terminologies here. First is the IP address. It's a 32-bit number. It uniquely identifies a host. Like uh, any device connected to the internet, it has an IP address. So this uh, tells how to find any device, so you can send data to it. And then there's a MAC address. So all the devices, they have a unique IP, uh, unique MAC address, media access controller. But the IP address, that can be virtual. It is determined by your like IP or any other, like uh, when you connect to the internet, your IP is determined by what the institute Wi-Fi and all they provide. But your device itself has a MAC address to uniquely identify that particular device. So, after that, there are ports. So, f you, like for your device is doing various things through the network. So, how to determine like uh, for what thing, what data is being sent? Like for web, some data is being sent. If you are opening a mail, some other data is being sent. So, for that, you have different ports. So, on client side, the ports are from 1024 to 65535. And on the server also, there are various ports for various sort of requests the server is getting. So, for HTTP, the default port is 80. So now those, there are different layers through which this uh, movement of data happens. So I talked about the protocols. They are used in, like TCP is used in the transport layer protocol and IP is used in the network layer protocol. So first, uh, we can start with the top. There is the application layer. So here is uh, where you start, you are using the application layer to you send the request or request some connection. Then. So the transport layer comes in, it establishes a connection between your computer and where you want to connect. Then the network layer comes in, this uh, like makes, makes it into smaller packets, the data, and so that you can transfer it. And then there's the data link layer. So this is the thing which connects the network layer to the physical layer, like the packets it has generated, it breaks it down further into frames, and those frames can be transferred bit by bit into the physical layer. And then the physical layer transfers it, like wirelessly or through some wire, Ethernet or anything. So this is the example. This is your message. Application layer, there you are going to create your message. It will go to the transport layer. Now the transport layer will add a header file to tell where to send the data. And then the network layer will add another header file on top of that to tell the IP address of where you are trying to send your packets. And then there's the data link layer, which will add the MAC address to make it like even more specific exactly where you're trying to send it. And then it, it goes bit by bit to the physical layer. So did you understand how those network layers work? Anybody has any doubts? Okay. So I will study a bit about the HTTP protocol. So whenever you use a site, it uses HTTP or HTTPS. So this is a member of the TCP IP family. This is the main foundation of the World Wide Web. Like all the web applications that run following this protocol. So like this is basically involved in sending any request to a server. So the default port is 80, but you can use other ports. 
So, a typical like uh, HTTP request will contain the, these following things. First will be the version type, what HTTP version you are using, then the URL where you are trying to send your request, some method. So I'm, I talked about some method like get post and all methods you are going to use. So for that there is a method. Then there is the request headers, and then there is the optional HTTP body for this. So I think I can show you one. Go to any site. So you are going to use this inspect element a lot if you are trying to solve any problems on the web and find vulnerabilities. So you can go there. See here, you can see the header. <laughs> Request method and everything, here you can see. And then there's the URL. So, a URL is just the address of the site where you want to go. So, HTTP is the scheme like the one you are using, the protocol you are using, then there is a domain name, the port which you want to go to. So uh, like normally you don't have to mention a lot this port and all because the default one is used. And then there is the path to the file. Nowadays uh, you don't like go to a file directly. It is abstracted away because if you can go to a file directly then like you can access the server backend things. It, it, this itself would be a vulnerability. Then there is the parameter like when you search anything on Google you probably see like the words are broken down and so on, like in this request, uh, you can see like Q equals R A and so on in, in here. So those are the parameters. And then there's the anchor. So the anchor is like uh, after the server sends you a whole the whole data, the anchor element can be used to find particular parts of that data. Like uh, I'll give you an example later. Okay, so the first part is the authority. After the HTTP, then colon and some, uh, double slash, this portion is called the authority, like I showed it here. The port and the domain name is the authority. So this is just the domain name and the port, but uh, sometimes if you're using like a mail client, so like you don't just access websites and HTTP requests, you also do something like mail to. So that is another protocol that you will be using. In that case, there is no authority. So you don't need any double slash. Then there's the domain name. So all the time, like uh, you're not going to know the IP address of where you're going to send anything. So there, the domain name service is very useful. So the URL actually, the, every URL is going to be mapped to different IPs, like a phone book. So the, the domain name service man manages that. For every different URL, there are IPs mapped. So different ports are used for different things as I told you earlier. So like for file transfer protocol, you're going to use 21, for HTTP 80, for HTTPS, you're going to use 443 and so on. So uh, now we are going to come up, come to understand the HTTP methods. So did you all understand URLs properly? Okay. So HTTP methods are like what kind of requests you're sending to the server, like what are you asking from it? The most common ones are get and post. So get is used to get some sort of data from the server and post is used to send some data to the server. And put requests are used to update some data on the server side. Like uh, if you want to change something in the database or anything, you are going to use put request. But mostly you won't, you won't be having access to such request. So these are some details of the HTTP request. You can study them later. So I already showed you that requesting earlier. Like 
when I use inspect element. So it has different parts like the method, which path, what scheme it's using, what kind of like thing you will accept. Like uh, when you're sending, asking for some data, you want only certain types. So you'll use accept and so on. So once you, once you send a request to a web server, you get some sort of response, right? So you may have seen different error codes, right? 404 and so on. So these are the HTTP status codes. And in the response also, there will be some error. So these are the different status codes. So if it is between 100 and 199, you know it's for like informational purposes. 200 and others are for successful responses. For redirection, you, it usually starts with a three and so on. So now we come to HTTP response headers. So like an, uh, when you send a request, you saw there was a request header. For response also, there is a response header. So this tells you like what kind of, like uh, the response you're getting, uh, what, what is the content type of it, what is the encoding of it, status and so on. So HTTPS. So does anybody know like what is the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? Anyone? Really? Nobody? <laughs> okay, so like it is just a secure version of HTTP because like uh, earlier any connection you make with the server, if it is not encrypted, anybody can like access whatever you are doing to the web if they intercept your messages. And there are various like packet uh, capture tools that you will learn later. So you can use them. If it is, if it is an HTTP connection, you will find out whatever the user was doing with the website. If they were sent, if they were doing some login or anything, you will get their passwords and everything. So HTTPS uses the secure sockets layer or transport layer security to encrypt the whole message. So like if there is no encryption, uh, like people can forge your message. Like uh, whenever you are using your browser to do any, like send some anything, the server on the end, they can only recognize your browser. So if uh, any attacker knows how, what your browser fingerprints and all are, there are various ways to determine like which different browser it, it is. So if they can find that out, they can go to the server and act like you basically. And they can steal your data, they can eavesdrop on any sort of conversation you're having. So that's why HTTPS is used. Okay, so I mentioned like the, there are ways, uh, there are different vulnerabilities in, on sites. So I mentioned three of them, I think. Uh, there was SQL injection, there was XSS, and there was deserialization attack. So I'll show you a small demo of how an SQL injection attack works. Okay, so like there's a small like uh, demo site I made just to show this. So no CSS. So you have a username and you have a password, like a login system you have on like any sites. So finding username for people is relatively easy, right? Like you can find their usernames if it is a public forum or anything. You can like literally see their usernames and they communicate with you or anything. But you don't know their password, so any idea how you can log in? Like uh, if I type just a random password, it won't work, right? Now there is no more page ahead of it, so if I do type the right password, we are actually going to get like some other thing. Like the actual password is just one two three. So type that and you're actually going to get an internal server and the reason you're getting this is simple. There is no site after this. So it doesn't know what to do with it. This is actually a 503 error. It, it does not, it has a communication server. It does not know what to do with this request. So now you don't know the password. So the mo most websites, they have an SQL uh, server on the backend. Like I told you, uh, in the backend to store files, you usually use a database 
or some sort of file system. So most of them have uh, SQL database. It's basically like it stores data in the form of tables and you can query it. So I'll write a payload and then I'll explain to you how why that works. Like I'll write something and if I write that, whatever be the password, it will work. Like it will take the login. It took the login, right? You saw. Uh, did you pay attention to what I wrote? You did, right? You remembered. Okay, I'll try to write it once again. See if it is. Okay, now it should be right. Visible? Okay. So, how does that work? I'll show you the code for the back end of the site and then I'll explain why this works, right? So, whatever be the password, this will work. Not on every site, obviously, there are ways to protect it and I'll show you that too. So, this is my backend, right? Yeah, you can see the code visible. Okay. So, what's happening in the code is uh, the form is there. It sends a, a username and a password through the request library. You can fetch, yeah, like, you're using this request to get the username from the form, like, right? username and the password. And normally, what it does is it uses this query, like, to get some data from the database. Visible? No? Can you see this part? Select star and all. Like, you can see this, right? This thing. So, this is what it does. Uh, it goes to the database and says, select like everything from this the table or like I told you it stores data in the form of tables. So there's the user's table. It asks like from this where the username is this and the password is this and it fetches it. So if there are no such records that means such user is not there and don't log in and if there is just log in. Right? So what we are what we are actually doing is exploiting how this thing is written. So we are putting in the right username and then what we are doing is the password is written like there is a starting quote and then there is an end quote in the middle you are inserting whatever. So what I am doing is I am inserting another quote there. So it is closing the password thing and then I am writing another query or one equals one. So in that case it will fetch the user now because that query is correct even though the password is not empty but the other condition or one equals one that condition is true now. So it will give me an output and that is why we can log in. So anyone has any idea how you can protect your website from this sort of thing? Anyone? Just any guesses? How will you protect your website? Or what changes you will do in this code to make sure that like, like, uh, no, like nobody can enter other people's usernames? So you will take it as a string, right? So that will just put another two colons, no? 
So I can just make a new payload for that. I will just put another code to finish up that string. And then again I'll put another condition for or. It doesn't matter what I'll put in the password again. So the actual method to do it is, uh, like the languages they have their own parsers to do it. Like you have to do it the same way but you cannot just uh, write like put it inside strings. What, what we'll do is whenever you're putting in a code, it will use an escape character. So it will not actually count as a code. The, the, then the programming language will understand that it is actually a code inside a code. Like it is not closing the code which was there earlier. It is just a random, it is a character. Like it is not a closing code. So that is how it works. Like uh, this is the other query. This one, the one I've commented out. So in here, it is like star s, star s, and then take the username and the password. So Python will automatically parse it properly. So if I put in a code, it will put escape characters there. Like, uh, you can maybe run this again to show. It won't matter though, like that's how this works. Uh, for like, now we'll come to another vulnerability, XSS. Cross-site scripting, uh, we will cover that. So thank you everyone. So uh, we'll look into another vulnerability of web application, uh, but uh, I don't have any demo, so uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, but yeah, I have visuals. Uh, so basically what is uh, cross-site scripting? So cross-site scripting is basically when uh, someone uh, can inject a JavaScript code into your browser. So in in despite of your knowledge like even if you don't know what is happening but it happens in the background process and you don't even know and your data gets like you uh, your data may be compromised or you may do you may uh, he, he may basically how do i say it uh, let's see an example okay uh, so this is a example of a self retweeting tweet okay here, some user has posted some tweet on the Twitter. Okay, it got stored in the Twitter database. Now, uh, this is a XSS attack because here you can see it's a JavaScript code. So, uh, it was a vulnerability in Twitter back in 2014. It has been patched, but still it is a great example to understand that as soon as someone opens this tweet, this script gets injected into your browser and it uh, what is does like we can look into it basically it is just retweeting it we can do it step by step uh, we'll try to understand it okay so you see it is creating a class xss uh, you don't need to worry about the javascript thing basically you just need to get the uh, gist of it that what it is actually is doing so basically uh, everything is a DOM element as uh, you have seen in the so you see everything here are made up of HTML elements on the web page okay so, so is the Twitter website here uh, you first find the retweet button which is there okay so you do it using some jQuery so you locate that button and then you click that button, okay. And this all happens in the background so your cursor don't move, okay. Because you can uh, click things using JavaScript as well because at the end when you click it, some JavaScript code is executed and that, like your clicking does not actually do anything directly but it injects, like it also runs a JavaScript code. Here the JavaScript code is directly doing it. So even if you don't want, uh, you have retweeted a tweet, okay. Uh, so these, this is one kind of XSS attack. So that is why XSS is a problem because uh, someone can hide behind your browser to do any kind of malicious activity and you won't even know about it. That's why it is generally said to not open spam emails. You know, why? Because 
emails contain nowadays uh, HTML messages as well. Okay, we also send uh, mails using HTML. Okay, there are images, there are styles, fonts. Okay, now if someone put some malicious script inside that, so as soon as you open the email, not even clicking it, just open it. If that thing renders on your browser, then it can do lot of things. So this is a small example of JavaScript code, what it can do. So here basically it is reading your cookies. Okay, so cookies are basically, you can say kind of your pass. If a user, ha if someone has your cookies, basically it has your login session details, not for long time, the cookies expire, but even for a short time, suppose uh, there is two hour duration cookie, so if it has access, it has access to your websites for two hours. Okay, so like cookies and sessions are different things, uh, but you just need to know that you have been compromised using XSS. Uh, similarly, there are uh, like in XSS, now you can uh, understand that there are three types, but uh, rather than types, I would like to say there are three, uh, three ways to look at this XSS. So one is the, first one is the reflected XSS basically which says that uh, the malicious script which is present is uh, reflected on your browser. Okay, so example in the Twitter case, I'll uh, like first we look into other example then I'll, it will be more clear. The second aspect of this is stored XSS. Okay, so this XSS is not problematic to the application itself, but to the end user. For example, in the Twitter's case, Twitter just stored the malicious code in their database, but they, they it was not harmful for the Twitter website itself, but the users who clicked on those website, they were compromised. So that's why this is like, there was, the user did not directly send the XSS payload uh, to the target. Basically, the our hacker or our malicious user did not directly send that payload, but rather it uh, put it on a trusted website where people themselves chose to open that. Okay, so it could be anywhere. So that's why uh, you should not go to like a website which you don't trust or like at least you may visit them in incognito where you don't have your data stored, okay. Uh, and the other one is the, like another aspect is DOM based XSS. So basically we saw that DOM, this, this whole thing is called DOM, which is the document object model. So here you can, uh, these, suppose your uh, payload was somewhere here and you now want to do something, click button somewhere here down. So uh, to navigate through that, uh, basically you, the XSS uses some kind of DOM knowledge, which was there in our Twitter case. And now we come back to the reflected XSS case. So basically here it happens when, uh, just for example, the Twitter case. Here the Twitter uh, just simply stored the, uh, whatever the tweet was there, it just stored it in its database. So what it should have done is sanitize this, basically put some escape sequences behind the script tag so as to differentiate that this is not a JavaScript code, this is a user-based text and you don't need to, uh, you don't need to parse this as an HTML. Okay, so this is called sanitization. It was not done previously. So similarly, there may be many websites which are prone to XSS and this is not the only kind of XSS. XSS basically means injecting JavaScript into your application. So like Twitter, such a famous company and till 2014, like this was possible. So, you know, XSS has like lot of, lot of variety of XSS attacks and there are still many XSS attacks you can check. Uh, and they get complicated as we progress, as we have more understanding. So like to prevent XSS attacks, the first, the easiest thing you can do is disable JavaScript. But obviously if you disable your JavaScript, you won't be able to run most of the applications on the web. Okay, so first of, it is also the, uh, 
the organization or you can say the software's responsibility to uh, prevent their website from like to defend uh, to be access as secure websites so and it is also the user's responsibility so as to browse wisely okay so uh, also for the developers we have a content security policy so So these are a set of rules which you can define uh, whenever you are uh, interfacing with the request. So you can see here also in headers there are some there are some CSP rules if you can see if I just reload this see. Uh, one such rule is this uh, that no sniff so this one kind of rule okay so basically these are for your browser so that uh, you don't need to altogether disable your JavaScript in order to be uh, in order to prevent the access at attacks but uh, these are some kind of rules which developers need to adapt to uh, in order to build safer websites for uh, so Okay, we covered this. Uh, yeah, another thing. Uh, there is also one cheat sheet which you can see where there are different types of access attacks. So there are many types of uh, access attacks. Obviously, everyone, uh, like each of them involves injecting some kind of JavaScript. So you know there is uh, you can purify your like whatever your input is so you need to sanitize that that is one kind which we have seen then there are also many libraries built upon this uh, so as to offer you some access uh, security but none of them are tight sealed so there are always some leaks and uh, that's why we get new vulnerabilities each year uh, in XSS also and in web XSS I think is the easiest one to start with so if you want you can start from XSS your journey okay uh, that's it thank you so hello I'll be uh, explaining about cryptography so uh, what is crypto cryptography cryptography is uh, protecting information with math uh, we can use uh, several mathematical algorithms to make our message unreadable to normal users and the one who is having the key can only read it and these mathematical algorithms uh, often require uh, modern cryptography requires some concepts like prime factorization XOR and elliptic curve cryptography and some quantum key distribution and uh, the only uh, the prerequisites are maths and scripting uh, you might be using some Python or C++ Python is preferred for this and extra knowledge might be required for some specific concepts so uh, we'll start with uh, history so uh, it was dated in 44 BC when Julius Caesar used Caesar cipher which I think everybody might be knowing we just shift alphabets like uh, we increase the count by 2 for example A will go to C and E will go to G and like that. Uh, then around 700 and 800 C uh, mono alphabetic ciphers were introduced and these were cracked also. Around 1400 uh, we had polyalphabetic cipher and 
1941, uh, I think everybody know about this machine also. It was also a specific polyalphabetic cipher. And now comes the modern cryptography with invention of RSA, which followed by AES. RSA uh, depended on number theory, uh, mostly on prime factorization and exponentiation. AES uh, depends on XOR and block, making blocks and taking XOR. And now we are having quantum key cryptography and so on. So I'll discuss the terms. So plain text is normal text, uh, normal message that we have. It can be hello, hi, or anything. Cipher text is a message that we have encrypted the plain text into. For example, uh, hello can be converted into a random number or a random string. Encryption, you might be knowing it is the process of encrypting the plain text into cipher text. Decryption is a reverse of encryption. And key, key is uh, something that combines with cipher text, not directly combines, uh, but it is used with cipher text to get uh, plain text. And hashing is another term which I'll discuss later. So normal cryptography uh, flowchart is like this. Uh, we have plain text and we encrypt it to get ciphertext. And on ciphertext, we use key and other functions to get, again, the plain text readable. Uh, OK. So uh, now monoalphabetic ciphers. Uh, it, it has one-to-one -one correspondence for each alphabet. Like uh, we discussed in Caesar cipher, like for a shift of two, A will go to, like, like in this image, it is ha it have shift of three. So A will go to D, D will go to E, and so on. Like Z, Z will go to C, and that time. And uh, by a monoalphabetic cipher, it does not mean we only shift. We can assign random order also. Like A can go to X, uh, B can go to A, and like so on. And these can be decrypted by uh, any guesses. How can we decrypt Caesar cipher? By? No, if uh, uh, suppose you don't know the shift. You can try. It's easy. You guess. Uh, it may be used, uh, it's right, but it would be, I think, long for serial cipher. Uh, we can directly brute force all 26 combinations and we can see which one is the meaningful uh, on it. And another way, if it's not Caesar cipher, it's like random key corresponding, like A is given to Z and B is given to A, like that we make them random order. So here we can use frequency analysis, like E is the most common alphabet used in English language, so we can see a cipher text and suppose we find letter X is used the most. So we can make a correspondence that X must be E. And using this, we can create a table of which letter is related to which letter and we can decrypt it. Uh, now there is simple exercise for you. So uh, can you decrypt this first one? It's Caesar cipher. Uh, okay, I'll do it. You can write a Python code also, or you can also take the help of internet. So there are online websites where you can uh, just type it and brute force attack on it and it will give you all list of these and you can see which one is most meaningful and this website already given the first one here is the meaningful one out of these. So we have decrypted this.
and other. Uh, how can you improve Caesar cipher? Look, it's not used now. It's a uh, weakest cipher now. So how can you improve it to make it more harder to decrypt? Yeah, yeah, the dead can definitely work. And an, one simple example is uh, we can use polyalphabetic cipher, which is next. Basically, polyalphabetic cipher, it, it has, we can do, the shift depends on the position of the letters. For example, for first letter, we can do a shift of one. For second, we can do a shift of three. For third, we can do a shift of five and so on. So. If the sender and receiver knows this trick, others, others cannot read this message. Uh, now comes the polyalphabetic ciphers. Uh, in the Caesar cipher, we used, in monoalphabetic ciphers, we used shift or a random one to one correspondence, which means if in a plain text there is A, uh, in ciphertext, A will be encrypted to always the same letter. It can be anything. But in polyalphabetic cipher, if there are multiple occurrences of A in uh, plain text, then ciphertext may have different letters for ciphertext. And it used several substitutions, like uh, if message is HII, so each I will be encoded to a different letter in polyalphabetic cipher. And some polyalphabetic ciphers are auto key cipher, Wigner cipher, transportation cipher. And these are harder to crack than uh, monoalphabetic cipher and some are extremely hard. So we'll be seeing this Wigner cipher for example. So uh, it uh, works on the use of this type of table where plain text is written on the top and of all 25 combinations one the alphabet series is shifted to one left. So for one, we have B, C, D, E, and so on. And for 25, we have Z, A, B, C, D, and so on. So if the plain text is this, hello, how are you? And key is green. So for Wigner cipher, we'll extend the key to match the length of plain text. Uh, so now this hello, how are you has 14 letters. So we will make the key to be having 14 letters. And now, if uh, G connects to H, then in the plain text, we'll look for G. And in the plain text, we'll look for H, sorry. And uh, the one starting with G, letters. So uh, in the plain text line, we have for H and for keyword, we have G. So we'll arrive at letter N, which will be a first letter of cipher text. Then we'll do the same for E and R, for E and R. Uh, we'll get a V. And similarly, we'll do for all this and we'll get the ciphertext. Uh, and this can be made even harder if uh, the keyword is very large or keyword is the same as plain text, then it will be impossible to crack. Uh, now we are coming to modern techniques. So modern techniques uses uh, number theory and advanced maths like group theory and XOR encryption and these uses asymmetrical keys. So uh, in earlier ciphers we saw, uh, suppose for monoalphabetic cipher, uh, the shift is called the key. Means if the receiver has the key, he can decrypt the message. In case of asymmetric keys, uh, the user, the sender and receiver both have different keys and these keys are related to each other and can be used to decrypt the message. So before going on, uh, does everyone here know modular arithmetic, uh, mod notation and its uses? How many of you know? 
Okay, I'll explain uh, one time. So modular arithmetic is same as uh, remainder division. So uh, we know like 24 divided by 5 leaves a remainder of 4. So we'll uh, write it as So 24 divided by 5 leaves a remainder of 4. So we can write. So uh, 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 how to read this? Uh, it means 24 is congruent to 4 mod 5. Means uh, it can work as equal sign. So we can subtract 4 from 24 and we see 20 is divisible by 5. So it's that notation. And we can do uh, same operations on both sides, not with this mod. We can add same numbers on both sides. It won't change. But the most important thing is uh, we can raise it to the same power and it won't change. So I can write this also. 24 cube will be congruent to 4 mod 5. Or 24 to power 300 will be congruent to 4 to power 300 mod 5. So we can find the remainders using this. So uh, now coming to RSA. Uh, its security is based on factorization of large integers. It involves public key and a private key. Like I mentioned in asymmetric key, uh, the sender and receiver both have different keys. So for encryption, uh, we choose two very large prime numbers, P and Q, and we take n as their product and we choose e greater than 2 as a part of public key which will be held by a sender and so public key is finished there n and e e can be e should always be greater than 2 an ideal value of e is 65537 which is mostly used uh, and one more important thing e sh should be co prime to n now private key is for, uh, calculated from this formula, LCM of P minus one and Q minus one. And your message M is converted to an integer small m. So every text can be converted to an integer according to any means. So I'll be using a specific me means here. Now ciphertext is just M to the power E modulus N. So So for RSA, uh, we mentioned in steps, uh, we'll choose two very large prime numbers. So 
in this code, first we'll encrypt our text. So uh, we'll keep our text to be in indoor. And uh, this code here uh, converts the text into an integer. So this is our integer corresponding to indoor. Now uh, this uh, line will get two random 64-bit primes. So and we'll com compute the lambda and product of these primes. What? No. Uh, now, uh, for ciphertext, uh, we'll, uh, denoted by C, will be m to the power e um, mod n. So uh, e is defined as 65537 and uh, this uh, code in Python is uh, m raised to power e, and the third uh, variable is for modulus. So it will calculate the ciphertext. So our in indoor is calculated, uh, indoor is converted into this string, and this is our encrypted string. Now, uh, private key is also calculated. Uh, private key depends on d and lambda. So lambda is already calculated. Private key is modular inverse of e with respect to lambda. So model inverse is calculated as e minus 1 lambda. So we have a private key exponent. And this is a ciphertext. And finally, for decryption. So one important thing for decryption is uh, the private key is denoted by uh, modular inverse of e with respect to lambda. So the rules have same rules apply for E equation and this congruence relation. So we can write DE is congruent to 1 mod n and DE is equal to 1. It's like DE is equal to 1. So if we have uh, C ciphertext and C is calculated as M raised to E. So here I have written M raised to E and C raised to D is this M raised to E and whole raised to D which will be multiplied. Powers will be multiplied and we know DE is congruent to 1. So it will be m. So our message is decrypted by ciphertext raised to power uh, private key exponent modulus n. So that's what we'll do. So so uh, the decrypted number is this, and it looks similar to one we have encrypted in DAR2. And finally, converting it into text uh, will get in DAR. So this was the encryption and decryption of RSA. And it's still used now for many in many applications. And it can be broken. It cannot be broken. But if we know partial key and like that, we can apply some algorithms. Uh, involving number theory to partially break it or fully break it. Uh, now coming to hashing. So anyone know hashing here? Uh, you might be used in, uh, you might have used in C++ hash maps. That no one. So uh, hashing, what it does, it, it we provide input of text or it can be a file also and it converts it into a fixed length string and it might be unique uh, suppose there is a string hello and uh, we denote a hash function let's call it h so the h function will uh, hash our, your given string into a fixed length string it, ca it will be alphanumeric or you can set uh, whatever you like 
and uh, the properties are every hash must be unique. If uh, there are collisions, it may be a problem. And hash function is always one way. It's not like regular math functions. It is repetition of many functions uh, involving random operations or involving XOR and like that. And hash functions are used in file integrity, password, digital signatures, cryptocurrency. Uh, like file integrity uh, is the most important place where hash function is used. Uh, suppose uh, if a file, how will you check if the file came from a uh, valid source? So uh, generally as the software developers release software with their hashes. So if you see uh, download of, like uh, if you download Ubuntu from anywhere, you'll also see uh, hash hash codes given for that files. So uh, most common are uh, SHA-256 and MD5. Uh, you will see on the download pages of many software, you will see MD5 hashes given. So uh, what the MD5 hash is, the whole file, whole ISO file of Ubuntu is converted into that hash and it cannot be reversed. So if any hacker modifies some part of that Ubuntu ISO and when you calculate its hash, it will be completely different from the hash specified. So it can be helped to verify file came from original developer or somebody have uh, cracked it or injected some code in it. It's also used in cryptocurrency, in mining, uh, for blockchain also. Uh, the common are message digest and SHA and these are similarly used for Bitcoin and file verification. And MD5 was cracked. It, uh, someone developed a code to generate MD5 collisions in 2014. So it's no longer used, but still famous. And the most popular is SHA-256. And it has received no collisions till now. Uh, 256 denotes 256-bit uh, key, means uh, any input you give, the output of SHA-256 hash will be 256 bits long. Uh, for MD5, it will be 128 bits long. Uh, like I mentioned in passwords, so whenever you store a password in database of reputed websites, so the websites, what it do, it when you input the password, they don't store your passwords in database. They convert your passwords into a hash and store that hash value in database. So by chance, if you know a hash of password and by chance, again, you suppose to find another string with the same hash. So you can input that same, uh, that another string and it will also log in the, in that way also. Now, uh, what? Any doubts? Okay. Uh, now there are some previous attacks uh, involving cryptography. Uh, this WannaCry ransomware, uh, how many of you know about this first one? No, only one. Uh, so it was pretty much popular in 2017 where most of the PCs were hacked and all its files were encrypted. Uh, it was due to a remote code execution uh, vulnerability in Windows. So hackers demanded money to uh, give the, to decrypt the user's files. Uh, same was the crypto locker ransomware. And breaking of Enigma machine, you all know Alan Turing, how uh, he cracked that polyalphabetic cipher and that. And in SolarWinds, uh, it was a company and uh, the hackers were able to log in by, uh, hackers were able to log in by some means by encrypting them, uh, by hiding themselves and login, logging as their users by hacking into their database and so on. Uh, so the list goes on and cryptography alone will not be used in world, uh, real world applications. Uh, there might be other vulnerability which is on the top of the crypto vulnerability. So only crypto is not there. Uh, it is mixed with some other vulnerability. 
Now, uh, these are some resources. And I would like to show you another website for cryptography. Uh, you guys should check this. Uh, it's very interesting and you can learn uh, many things by experimenting from it. So it has input and output panel. So you can write anything. So in the left panel, you can uh, use any of the recipe. Like if I want to use Caesar cipher, so it's uh, in our world, it's called rot cipher, ROT, uh, which basically means rotating. So uh, 13 is the key amount. So uh, you can change the shift from that and change this. So our problem can also be solved from this. Uh, we see by changing the amount, we see for 34. 34 is not the valid value. It must be less than 26. So we see uh, the shift was 8, which gives a meaningful result. Uh, it has other things like you can do hashing also. Like I will show MD5 hash. So uh, applying MD5 hash converts this string into this random alphanumeric string and it will be unique for every letter. Like if, okay, I'll write it for A, oh no, sorry. Uh, like MD5 for this string is this. So if I change only one letter, the whole hash will be changed. You can see it starts with CB369 and so on. I just, uh, for K, I put O and it completely changes. So it's used in file integrity verification. If anyone made some changes in uh, uh, software and so its hash will completely change and we can know about it. Uh, you can look other hashes also, like uh, SHA-2, SHA-3 and other. It's SHA-512, you can SHA-256 also and so on and you can convert binary, decimal, and other things also. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, there's also a magic uh, thing in this. So what magic does is it uh, tells the entropy, entropy of your text. So for a hash, entropy must be highest, means it must be completely random. So it's uh, not a hash, it's entropy is 3.65. But if we take a hash of it, like, and now see its entropy, it's increased. So that's it.